Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Odette Rosenbaum. Uh, I'm from the George Washington University and I'll be the moderator uh, of this uh, session. Uh, before we start, uh, please uh, make sure that uh, you are muted in order to avoid any background uh, noises. Uh, the author and actually the co-authors uh, both hear the welcome questions. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, uh, you can uh, uh, raise hand virtually and uh, Ruth will, will uh, call on you to, uh, to, to ask your question. Uh, please, if you can, uh, keep your webcam on. It makes uh, the, uh, the workshop uh, much more lively uh, to see uh, other people's faces. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Ruth Ruth from uh, the Hebrew University, uh, who is going to talk to us about mandatory cash flow forecast in financially distressed firms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oded, and thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a, an opportunity to present this paper. Um, and in this paper, we refer to a very fundamental, fundamental question in accounting of whether the regulator should require the disclosure of forecasts, or should it remain under the discretion of managers? And we're going to be using a unique disclosure a requirement from Israel. And so to give you a little bit more about the motivation, we know that forward-looking disclosure was found to be one of the most important accounting-based information that is used by investors. Bayer et al, for example, shows that this information is even more important than other accounting-based information, such as early earnings announcement, SEC filings, as well as analyst forecasts in explaining the variance of the quarterly uh, earnings return. But we know that this information is even more important in times of uncertainty. Shiva Kumar et al, for example, shows in during the financial crisis in, in 2008, the importance of that such information. But also an example from the SEC, the importance that the SEC uh, sees in this information, we can see from, uh, from the last pandemic during 2020, when the SEC issued a public statement emphasizing the importance of disclosure that is more forward-looking rather than historical. And so our paper is not, of course, not a, a, a COVID paper, but this is an, perhaps an indication that uh, companies would not necessarily always disclose such information, and we see that the SEC had to uh, encourage company to uh, uh, disclose this information. We're going to be focusing in this paper on uncertainty in the, for in the form of distressed firms. And next, when we look at when we talk about forward-looking information, as I mentioned, this is the, the example in the literature for a voluntary disclosure. And is that this information suffers from the selection bias that characterizes such information. So companies disclose this information when they benefit from, uh, from it. And for example, Musu et al. shows that when the information, uh, the price efficiency is low, companies disclose a more uh, forward-looking disclosure and so on. But there's also the concern of a bias of these uh, disclosure of these forecasts. And prior research have found that it is even less reliable in financially distressed firms. And so that raises the concern of whether a mandatory disclosure rule should be applied in certain circumstances. And we know that that mandatory disclosure rule should be applied when market mechanisms, it does not provide enough uh, information to investors. And so we're going to be focusing, as I mentioned, on uh, in, in investing the, on the setting of a, a unique disclosure from Israel, uh, where companies were required by the Israeli Security Authority to disclose cash flow forecasts. And there are two conditions that require this disclosure. And those are if a company has bonds, credit bonds that are held by the public, as well as financial warning signals that indicate financial difficulties such companies are required to disclose forward-looking information. And the purpose of this disclosure was, of course, to inform debt investors that are uh, in less sophisticated, less savvy uh, uh, bondholders 
uh, just to make the point that companies that have bonds that are held solely by institutional investors are not required to disclose this information. The warning signal that the Israeli Security Authority refers to are uh, mainly financial ratios such as equity deposit or negative working capital together with ongoing negative cash flows from operations. Uh, or if there is any emphasis of matter paragraph uh, of the uh, auditors in the auditor's report referring to any financial uh, difficulties. And so these uh, financial ratios are, I would just uh, make the point that they are uh, part of the Olson model uh, for predicting a uh, financial uh, bank. Uh, to show you how this disclosure uh, looks like, you can see here an example from a company named Azarim Properties. And this company was required to disclose cash flow forecasts in its 2013 uh, financial report. So I, not sure I mentioned, but these uh, forecasts are disclosed together with, are bundled together with the uh, annual uh, filing of companies. Companies in Israel do not disclose early uh, earnings announcement. Uh, and these uh, forecasts are disclosed together with the filing of their earnings uh, announcement. And you can see here that the company is required to disclose the expected cash flows for the next two years. So you see here 2014 and 2015. And you can see that the, the level of, of the disclosure is quite detailed. And the requirement is to disclose both the expected sources of cash flows, but also expected liabilities of uh, cash flows. And both these uh, two groups have to be uh, disaggregated to cash flow from operation, as well as investment and finance activities. So you can see that uh, the opening balance of cash flows, uh, that would be the, the closing balance of cash flows for the prior year. And if you add a so expected sources, deduct the expected liabilities, we get the closing balance of uh, expected cash flow forecast for the next two years. And so uh, our research question is whether mandating disclosure of management forecasts is desirable. Uh, and more specifically, we look at whether this information is credible, whether it provides useful information to investors, whether this uh, cross-sectionally, when does this information is more important, we look at more severely distressed firms relative to less uh, distressed firms, and we also look at whether there is any economic effect of this uh, disclosure. Uh, Ruth, uh, you have a question from the audience uh, uh, by Jeremiah who asks, what are the consequences of not providing these forecasts or of providing useless forecasts? Okay, so thank you for this question. Uh, so this is a requirement, it's a, it's a mandatory requirement. Companies have to disclose this information and we have evidence of the Israeli Security Authority penalizing companies that did not disclose this information or did not disclose it adequately. Uh, so if they did not provide enough information as required by the guidance, uh, they were penalized by the Israeli Security Authority. Uh, we also see some uh, uh, legal uh, uh, lawsuits against companies that disclose the inadequate uh, uh, disclosure. And so the, it is uh, information that because it is mandated is also an enforcement of this disclosure by uh, the, reg the regulators. Ayunga, I see you have a question. Oh, yes, so like my question also related to your earlier example. Um, so. You mentioned that firms are required to disclose those forecasts uh, only when they have those negative financial indicators, right? Equity. Mm -hmm. So uh, once they actually become healthier financially, then they are not required to provide those forecasts. Is that correct? So it's correct. not a complete time series. It's conditional on they are financially distressed. Correct. Yeah. And and the financial distressed indicators are publicly available? like. Um, the firms have to disclose all those numbers regardless of this requirement. So everyone can see who's distressed, who's not. Yeah, so these financial ratios, as well as the emphasis of matter in the auditor's uh, report, it's all uh, public information. Companies, uh, investors can see this information from, uh, from the public uh, financial statements of companies. 
So my last question is, I think your motivation is about voluntary disclosure in the US setting and then mandatory disclosure in this Israeli setting. So are you able to actually identify firms who are not willing to disclose voluntarily, but kind of are forced to disclose based on this requirement? So that was a place where you can document some externalities or unwillingness to disclose, uh, but somehow that information becomes available due to the regulation. Are you able to identify uh, the firms that kind of like their voluntary disclosure choice is not consistent with the mandatory requirement? So I'm not sure if you refer to whether companies would, uh, some companies would disclose this information voluntarily. Uh, because we do you not, don't... So we do not observe, so prior to this requirement, we do not observe any disclosure of cash flow forecast by companies uh, in a voluntary uh, manner. So, so this was not disclosed uh -huh. voluntarily prior to this uh, regulation. Uh, I see. Uh, so everybody can let, never voluntarily provide this information until the regulation. We don't see any evidence of companies disclosing it prior to their regulation requirement. Okay. So everyone, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Kent, yes. Yeah, just a short clarifying question here. W with regard to these uh, forecasts of cash flows, uh, is there any uh, research on the precision of those forecasts? I mean, um, that that would perhaps be another paper, but it would be interesting. Um, are these forecasts that are given two years into the future, um, are they good or not? So, so you're asking whether uh, ex post we find that this uh, information, the re after looking at the realized uh, cash flows, whether this information is accurate. Yes. And so we have another paper that looks into the uh, into this uh, question, uh, and uh, and with regard, I would say that with regard to some of the the disclosure with regarding to the operating cash flows, we do find that companies uh, provide information that is more accurate. So the realization is is seems very close to a uh, uh, to the uh, forecast. With regarding to the other components of the cash flows, uh, we find that there there is some uh, upward bias uh, uh, by companies. And by the way, in the other paper, we show that this uh, this upward bias forecasts uh, are explained by mainly behavioral uh, uh, biases. We show that in certain companies uh, where uh, behavioral biases are more um, are greater, we look at eponymous companies, but that is a different paper, but there is, we look at the, that is a different paper where we look at the, at the exact, whether these, these uh, forecasts are, um, um, their outcome or the realization are, is very close to uh, the forecast error, I would say is, uh, is accurate. Here we're gonna, I'm gonna be looking at the informativeness of this uh, disclosure requirement. So whether, uh, the investors perceive this information as credible and reliable, and we'll see that consistently some of this information is perceived as more reliable, uh, but not all of it. So we'll be focusing specifically on, uh, on the relevance of this information to bond investors. And the reason, the reason for that is because the regulation objective was to inform mainly bond uh, holders. Uh, so these, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, regulation was uh, uh, initiated uh, in light of the global credit crisis in 2008, where many companies in Israel that issued public debt encountered difficulties in repaying their, uh, their debt. And there, therefore, the ESA required this uh, disclosure uh, where the purpose was to inform debt, debt holders uh, with regarding to the expected liquidity of, of the company and if necessary, uh, to uh, begin any uh, reorganization of the debt in a relatively early uh, stages. So that is one reason why we focus on the Israeli uh, bond uh, market and the relevance of this information to the bond market. But also many of the companies in our data set uh, have only bonds that are listed uh, uh, rather than equity. And for companies that do have equity listed, we see only a limited trading volume. So I want a few words about the Israeli bond market because uh, it is. Uh, 
Just yeah. to say, you have a question by uh, by uh, Meyer. Hi, hi Meyer. Hi Ruth. Um, I have a two part question. One is, uh, with respect to bondholders, I prior research re related to equity holders mostly focus on operating cash flows. With respect to bondholders, would their emphasis on cash generating ability or repayment uh, ability differ slightly? Uh, looking at perhaps investing and financing cash flows as well, would the emphasis actually uh, be slightly different? Um, so that's part one. The other thing is I was really interested in the slide that you showed before with the state of the cash flows from the example uh, Israeli company. That seems to be a lot different from what we uh, used to see with the state of the cash flows like for a US company, for example, with the expected liabil liability section, like all of that information kinds of sort of are in a different format. Are there significant differences between how uh, state of the cash flows is prepared under the US uh, Israeli setting and the US setting that we as researchers should probably be uh, aware of before we draw uh, um, like extend it to the US setting uh, the inferences? So with regard to your second question, if uh, the report of financial of the cash flow forecast is not different in Israel than in the U.S., uh, with regard, so what you saw the the disclosure of forecasts uh, regarding cash flows, it is required to be presented in the way that I showed, but it doesn't that that does not reflect on the statement uh, of cash flows. Okay. Uh, so statement of capitals are similar to the, uh, the U.S. and this information, thing, specifically, the regulator requires uh, to distinguish between uh, the sources, expected sources, and expected liabilities. And uh, uh, yeah, so but, but I would just say that there is a, a, additionally the, the Israeli Security Authority also requires companies to show ex ante results with comparing the forecasts with the uh, realization of the forecast if there is major differences. So investors can see by line items the, whether uh, there's differences uh, between the uh, forecast and its realization. And uh, okay. Ruth, I, I have a question uh, about the, the kind of like the research question, right? So your research question is whether uh, these forecasts are desirable, right? And for that, you need to understand whether there is I mean the bon the benefit I think there there there's a sense that there is a benefit, uh, but when you think about the other side of it, the cost, I would assume that the cost is minimal because companies are doing those forecasts, especially if company fees is, is distressed, they'll they'll do it anyway for their own operating and and, and management purposes. Uh, so if you just look at kind of like at the broad question, right? Are these desirable? Wouldn't like your uh, I kind of like ex ante be that the answer is yes? So I'll show some prior era research uh, with regard to a uh, forecasts and uh, and specifically in financially distressed firms uh, to see that there is tension in the literature with regarding to what we would expect uh, this information to be the credibility of this information in such companies. Uh, but you are right that that's that our, our hypothesis is that it, indeed this information should be more uh, credible uh, uh, for uh, for comp for such companies uh, and in, in this uh, setting. Um, I would like to add on this point that I, I think it's actually not trivial because if we think about uh, management forecasts. I, I, I don't know that we will obviously say, let's force all managers to provide the sales forecast, earnings forecast. Um, so so I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a de design question and a policy question be because of the uncertainty, because of the uh, difficulty in forecasting. And, and just to reiterate what Ruth mentioned, this is a required and regulated disclosure in the sense that you would to Kenneth's uh, question before, I think it was uh, a Jeremiah's question. The, the, the Israeli SEC will um, levy a cost from you to enforce it and, and there might be legal, and there have been some legal repercussions of not providing the disclosure. 
Yes, I am. Yeah, so since Billy kind of mentioned on the design question, one thing I've been thinking is, uh, did the regulator consider the accrual based numbers? Like, why do they only focus on cash flow? It's because that's other accounting uh, estimates or judgments somehow is not the focus or is not that useful for the bond market in this setting? Or is there any discussion? Yeah, so that there's no yeah. discussion, but uh, we know that also from prior research, the uh, bonds uh, investors uh, are interested in cash flows uh, rather than uh, than uh, accruals. Um, and we will we'll see uh, some. We we uh, in our examination we'll see that there also the accruals are not uh, do not derive any bond response. Okay. And then related to kind of the mayor's earlier question is that if cash flow is more relevant for the bond market, uh, did you kind of disentangle which component of the cash flow is operating cash flows or cash flow from financing yeah. or investing? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Israeli, uh, Israel had the uh, developed debt market. Bonds in Israel are traded in a centralized exchange, uh, similarly to stocks, and not over the counter as is in, uh, in other countries, such as in the US. And therefore, it offers high liquidity, lower spreads, and lower trading costs. And th these uh, features of, the, of the, the Israeli bond market allows us to observe a bond reaction directly from uh, bond returns rather than from derivatives on bonds uh, such as CDS, as was done by prior uh, research, uh, mainly using uh, US data. Uh, so the rationale, the rationale for, for studying the, the, the informativeness of uh, financial information in general to bond investors uh, of course, comes from the different payoff structure uh, of bonds relative to equity, and uh, that is based on the on option pricing theory. You see here that uh, bond investors are viewed as having a put option and firm's assets, and the sensitivity of the, of the put uh, option price is uh, greater when the value of assets and value of claims uh, are closer, and that is uh, uh, leads us, or the or prior research, that is the motivation for studying uh, the relevance of uh, information in bond investors, mainly in financially distressed firms. That when we that is when we would expect information or debt investors to be more sensitive to such information. Uh, with regard to related literature, we focus on two uh, two main literature. First, we look at yes, I can. Just a short comment here. I don't think you have to do it so complex here with with option pricing or anything like that. I mean, basically, you have a sample here of firms that are showing signs of financial distress. So they are becoming, starting to become distressed. And as an, uh, also an equity investor, but as a bond investor, you start to worry about, okay, when is this firm going to drop dead? And typically, the firm drops dead when the, they run out of run out of cash flows. So you're really interested in figuring out: Are they being able to serve their cash flow needs here over the coming periods, or are they going to drop dead very quickly? So, so I, I think it's a very sensible way of 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 you. You really want to know something about the cash flows here over the coming two years when firms are starting to show financial distress signs because those are going to be crucial for the firm, um, whether it's going to drop dead or not in the coming years. Right, right. So, yeah, so I agree. Uh, I agree that, yeah, perhaps it's, uh, it is intuitive to, uh, to understand that this information is, is important in uh, such companies. Uh, but if you look at prior literature, so we can see here a, a, a literature that looks at the credibility of forecasts, specifically in financially distressed firms, and, and this literature suggests that this information is less reliable in such companies. Uh, forecasts are, are more biased relative to uh, non-distressed companies. Rogers and Stocken uh, looks at US uh, um, companies and they show different incentives of companies to uh, manipulate uh, forecasts. They show that specifically for financially distressed firms, uh, conditioning on the fact that the, there is higher ability uh, to detect misrepresentation, 
or on the contrary, they show that when there is less ability to detect misrepresentation, misrepresentation those forecasts are overly optimistic relative to non-distressed companies. Kato Skinner and Konimura is an interesting paper because they look at a unique setting from uh, Japan where the Tokyo Stock Exchange encourages companies to disclose forecasts. And in practice, all companies disclose uh, earnings forecasts and sales forecasts, and they uh, therefore perceive this information as effectively mandatory. Uh, and they show that these forecasts are upward biased in, systematically and even more so for small firms and low performance. And, and so understanding whether there is a change in the credibility of, such in, of information uh, when, this in, when it is disclosed mandatorily uh, in distressed firms would, would be interesting. Yes, Ayung. Yeah, Ruth, I, I feel like the literature here is not kind of like really comparable to what you're doing. So like, let me kind of like confirm with you. I, I think the literature here you're citing are comparing financial distressed firms to financially healthy firms. And under uncertainty, those financial distressed firms forecast somehow just noisier or potentially biased. But your setting is conditional on financial distress, uh, right? You are comparing having the information about future forward-looking cash flow versus not having it. And then you are claiming that having that information is credible and useful for bondholders or investors to forecast the future, like 12, uh, two years of the payoff likelihood. So I think you're, I just want to clarify that whether your control group or benchmark is also financially distressed firms without information, or are you comparing your sample firms to financially healthy firms? Like who is your benchmark? In the... So the benchmark would be a finance firms that are close to financial uh, distress, so they're very similar with regard to their financial difficulties uh, that did not disclose the information. Yes, okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the second literature we focus on is with regard to the informativeness of forecasts specifically to bond investors. And, and prior research uh, shows that it is more important in firms with uh, poor credit rating. Uh, Kitagawa and Shuto looks at the same setting uh, from Japan and show that this uh, information, because it is upward bias, bond investors do discount these uh, earnings forecasts. Uh, so, so to understand whether such information would be uh, important, relevant, or uh, incredible to investors, um, we're going to examine the bond reaction to this uh, information. I want to just go over the uh, main differences in our setting compared to a uh, prior literature. And as you said, Ayung, the, there are major differences in the setting, in our setting compared to, uh, to the literature I uh, mentioned. And so just to summarize, the forecasts we're looking at are mandatory uh, uh, disclosed, and therefore they are regulated both ex ante and are enforced exposed, as I mentioned earlier. Companies uh, are required to disclose this information, and it is, there is a very detailed guidance regarding the form and the content of the disclosure. And it is also important, as I mentioned, companies are penalized for not disclosing uh, adequate uh, uh, cash flow forecast. Uh, this information is about cash flows and earnings, uh, and we know that it is less uh, prone to manipulation. And you saw that the information is quite detailed and uh, disaggregated, and therefore it would be easier to detect uh, any reporting manipulation and the incentive uh, for companies to um, manipulate this information is therefore uh, uh, mitigated. And we're looking at focusing on bond investors and firms in financially distressed firms where cash flows are uh, more important in such companies. And so our uh, main hypothesis, uh, considering our, the characteristics of our disclosure, the fact that it is forward-looking, it is regulated, it is detailed and pertains to cash flows, and the fact that we would expect bond investors to be more sensitive to information in financially distressed firms, leads us to expect that they manage the, these cash flow forecasts, it would be informative to uh, bond investors. And our main findings, we find that indeed bond investors uh, react. Uh, yes, Odette. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
I don't know if the, the data is available, but because you said that uh, this regulation only applies to uh, companies with uh, the turnover portfolio held by institutional investors, but uh, can you kind of like, do you have the data to check whether uh, there's the difference between how institutional investors and uh, retail investors are using these forecasts? So as I, as I mentioned, the, the idea of this uh, disclosure requirement was to inform uh, investors that are uh, publicly uh, uh, retail investors that are less sophisticated and have uh, no other uh, ways of uh, of getting uh, information from com from companies. Uh, Reg FD does not exist in uh, in Israel, uh, so therefore uh, the purpose of this disclosure was to inform such investors. Um, but you're asking whether there is different in the in the response of the uh, institutional versus the uh, retail investors. Right. Yeah, it would be interesting to 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 see whether you know they might also uh, find this information be beneficial, right? Because there is an underlying assumption that the institutional investors would know what's going on, uh, and you know, I, just for me, it would be interesting to to know whether this is in fact correct or not. Just kind of like adding another depth or cross-sectional test mm -hmm, to your mm -hmm. paper. Yeah, thank you. That that is something that we'll uh, try to do. Jeremiah? I have a question that's sort of related to um, the your table four, I think, and, and, and related to what you're talking about distressed firms. Um, if a company is financially distressed so that they have to do these forecasts, but the their ratings are not low. What does that mean? What does it mean that you're you can have high credit ratings, but be financially distressed? Yes. Yeah, so, so that is a good question, and uh, as you mentioned, is it is another uh, cross-sectional test that we uh, perform. Uh, so those are mainly companies that have their uh, collateral for their bonds, and therefore their rating uh, is higher than uh, than in other companies without collateral. Um, and so that would explain why there are differences, even though these are firms in financial uh, distress. So you're saying that they have the reason that companies have high credit ratings is because there is high collateral and that it, it doesn't have anything to do with them being in financial distress or not. Yes, so these are secure debt and therefore uh, the rating is uh, higher even though the finance the company itself is in uh, in distress and has uh, this uh, warning uh, signals um, and it re still requires to disclose this information. So, so the regulator does not refer to any uh, anything with regard to the rating of the bonds companies will be required to disclose this information uh, regardless of the, the uh, rating of, of its bonds. I, I think that's a good answer. I mean, my concern would be that, um, I guess my question about this is, could it be that what the regulators say is financial distress isn't always actually financial distress? That, um, the regulators have some trigger that says you got to go ahead and make these disclosures, but the credit rating agency says, yeah, that's just, um, it, you know, it's sort of like these tripwires that prior research has talked about. It's a tripwire. They have to do this. And, but we all recognize that it's not a big deal. So we sort of ignore this. Um, and I guess, so my question would be, are you actually identifying financial distress or are these, um, mandatory disclosures necessarily related to financial distress or are they sort of sometimes getting companies where it that's a sort of false trigger i guess is my question but i mean i think i like your answer that could that could be the case but i i think that, i guess i would like a little reassurance that that is what's happening is all i'm saying Yes, so you're right that sometimes you know these financial uh, rashes would capture uh, companies that are not necessarily uh, in real uh, uh, economic difficulties, uh, but they will see required to disclose this information. Um, and you see that the results indeed are driven from companies with uh, low rated bonds. So it is uh, important for uh, financially distressed firms, other companies, 
um, uh, this information is, is would not is not as you see is not a but we didn't get to these results yet. We're gonna get there hopefully soon. Yes, Ken. I'm sorry to disturb your presentation here the whole time, no. but but I mean no, basically no. what you find here is that um, there is a positive stock price reaction when there are good news in these forecasts, and that is in itself should be an indication of this being uh, a reduction of the distress risk of the firm. Because I mean, otherwise, it's it's hard to imagine why this why the bond prices should go up. So the fact that you see this positive coefficient is in alignment with the idea that um, the distress risk of the firms are reduced. So it's an it, it's in alignment with the idea that the forecasts here are credible. A question, though, that I would have is: you also say that they are informative. So then we have a difficult more difficult question in the sense that okay if we had not seen these forecasts by these firms um how would the prices have reacted then so then the question comes would it have been possible to make these forecasts from other available information in the financial statements so you basically could have seen the same reaction that's my question about the informativeness Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely correct, and we try to uh, examine that by using a naive model forecast uh, that estimates a, a future cash flow forecast using historical uh, forecasts uh, and, and through a, a, a mathematical model, and we do not find that there's any reaction to these forecasts uh, derived from the naive model. Okay, so I guess, yeah, so that alleviates uh, the, the concerns of uh, the, the reliability or the informant, the content of the information uh, of the cash flow forecast. How, how sophisticated was the model that you used here as an alternative? Was it just uh, a naive random walk idea or was it something more sophisticated? So we do use we use a, a random walk with a trend to uh, to assess this uh, naive cash flow forecast. Uh, but if you have any other ideas, uh, uh, we would uh, welcome it. Uh, it is a, a place that maybe we we could do more uh, to show that the the results do not come from uh, other sources of information, regardless of these uh, cash flow forecasts. So here I am, so they, uh, we find that indeed alternative forecasts that are estimated from a naive model do not capture any bond price reaction. We find that the results are driven by uh, non-investment grade bonds uh, and that the uh, reaction is not reversed in subsequent periods. So it's not an overreaction that is reversed uh, afterwards. And then conditioning and firms going under reorganization, we find a economic effect in the form of higher recovery rates in companies that disclose this information uh, relative to companies that did not or were not required to disclose this information. And so we contribute to two strands of the literature, first to uh, the credibility of management forecasting in a mandatory versus a voluntary regime, and of course, also to the relevance of accounting information in general and forecasts in particular in uh, to bond markets. Uh, and by our, our unique setting, we are also uh, add here by that to the poll by uh, Locke and Richardson uh, to identify and investigate relations between accounting information and credit markets, specifically in settings where the information attribute is of primary relevance to credit market, and we believe that our setting uh, satisfies this, uh, this requirement. So our data and methodology, so we use uh, a web scraping tool uh, to uh, uh, gather all the financial forecasts of companies. Uh, we download all the, the financial statements of companies traded at the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and together with textual and manual search, we identified uh, 440 firms with the cash flow forecasts. Uh, other information, financial data is from WorldScop and Super Analyst, which is an Israeli uh, vendor, and bond trading are from the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Uh, in our methodology, we use a propensity for match between treated and non-treated uh, observations. And we estimate the propensity of a company to uh, be treated and disclose this information using a profit model. Um, 
with Kavari, it's proxying for the financial difficulties, and, and, and some of them are uh, the ratios, the financial ratios that are uh, required by the ESA for disclosing this information. We perform a one to one match uh, with the caliper of 0 0.15 and end up with 227 treated observations that are matched to a similar number of non treated uh, observations. Um, and so you can see here then not the, the descriptive statistics of the unmatched sample is some major differences exist before the matching. You see that treated companies as we would expect are uh, much less profitable, uh, are lev more leveraged than, than non-treated companies and are uh, more and are smaller than relative to a non-treated uh, uh, companies. And you can see here the descriptive statistics after the matching you can see that indeed these uh, differences uh, uh, vanishes. These companies uh, after their matching procedure uh, are more similar. Um, and so, uh, so this alleviates the endogeneity concern that uh, comes from functional forming specification. Uh, and so the next thing our, uh, in our research design, what we do is we look at bond market reaction to cash flow forecasts. Uh, while controlling, of course, for uh, earnings news, as I mentioned, these uh, forecasts are bundled together with, uh, with earnings. Um, our, um, our, independent vari our, our dependent variable is the weighted average cumulative abnormal bond return in a window of 11 days around the, this uh, information announcement. And this, uh, cumulative, this abnormal bond return is calculated using the matching portfolio model and following Best and Binder et al. Where we, we match uh, uh, bonds uh, to a matching portfolio with regard to their maturity and their rating. Uh, the, uh, our main uh, uh, variable of interest is the change in projected cash flows uh, from operating activity, which reflects the change in expectation with regard to future cash flows and is calculated as the difference between the projected cash flows from operating activities. Uh, to the actual the operating activity, uh, the cash from operating activities that was reported in the uh, in the report, uh, and it is deflated by the lag of total assets, uh, and so we would expect, according to our hypothesis, that this uh, beta one would be uh, positive and significant if indeed this information is uh, reliable uh, to investors. And we find that indeed that this, uh, this coefficient or the price response is significant uh, and positive, um, indicating that a 1% increase in the projected cash flow from operating activities uh, leads to a bond return, a 11 day bond return of uh, 5%. In column two, we decompose the net income uh, the, which is the news in earnings into news in accruals and operating cash flows. And as we, uh, uh, as was asked before, I think by Ayum, you can see that the information that is conveyed by uh, also with regard to the current cash flow does uh, load and, and it has some uh, uh, significant uh, uh, result. Yes, Oded. Yeah, so. I mean, I understand like this match sample, but at the same time, it's a little bit unintuitive to me because in the match sample, right, the, the control group is not really providing a forecast, right? So, so, so in a way, it's like it's zero for them, and I understand the coefficient, but you know, but but still, it's kind of like it's it's, it's not something that I kind of like I'm used to seeing. So, in regard to that, I think it would be interesting to just look at the graded firms, right? and uh, do an analysis before and after the regulation, right? Or companies that would have had to disclose uh, before the regulation, but because of the regulation, they didn't. And see kind of like what did investors uh, rely on then, right? Because when I look at the control variables, change in net income or anything else, nothing loads. Uh, and it would have, you know, it would be interesting to, to see if you know, like in the pre-period before the regulation, companies that would have had to disclose under the regulation would kind of like we would see something else or that, that investors were, were relying on the earnings news or, or some other news or cash balancers or, or, or something like that. 
so that is a great point and and I think it would be a, it would be optimal if we would be able to do a like a diff and diff examination here and look at the prior to the regulation. One of the problems that we had, first of all, is companies did not provide this disclosure voluntarily prior to this uh, regulation. But moreover, there are major differences in uh, in the accounting setting in Israel as uh, prior to this uh, regulation, uh, the international financial reporting standards was adopted. And so we're not there. This different, this major uh, adoption of, uh, of this, uh, the, the international financial report does not allow us to to distinguish whether the results that we'll find are indeed uh, coming from a uh, this, uh, disclosure regulation. And that's what we're, that's why we're not comparing to prior the, to the regulation, but rather uh, to a comp similar companies within this um, the, these years of uh, where this regulation was required. Yes, Ayung. I just have a clarifying question because I think this is um, clarifying your control group is very important to distinguish your paper from the prior literature when they actually compare all the quiz compute stat firms, right? So you are matching based on the maturity and credit rating, right? And then your treatment and control differs in terms of whether the regulator identified a firm as financially distressed or not. So this is kind of the other way to ask Jeremiah's earlier point is that your control group will be the firms with similar credit rating with the treatment firm, but somehow they did not trip the wire uh, based on those regulators used criteria. But the treatment firm will be the one actually hit one of those three criteria so they are required to provide this forecast. Is that a fair statement of uh, your matching design? So the matching procedure is not based on, uh, on rating. It is based oh. on financial ratios that indicate uh, financial difficulties. And so you can view it as, as okay. companies that are right below the threshold of, uh, of the requirement of the ESA to disclose this information. Uh, and so you can see here uh, the uh, we estimate the the propensity of companies to be treated using the following covariates uh, in earnings, operating cash flows, uh, loss whether the company uh, uh, disclosed a loss or a profit, leverage, size, and and so on. So so these are uh, uh, covariates that indicate financial difficulties at the firm level and not at the bond level. Uh, for bond with regard to bonds. Uh, mm. The weighted the the calculation of the abnormal bond return uh, is calculated with respect to a portfolio with similar rating and and, and maturity. Uh, and for a company, if a company has more than one series of bond, we calculate the weighted average of all the bonds for a company uh, using the market value of uh, such of the bonds. Uh, so the matching procedure is done again by comparing companies that are very similar with regard to their financial difficulties, but are right below the threshold and therefore they are not required to disclose this information. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Could, could I ask, I mean, you have then basically two groups of firms here and they are in many dimensions here very similar. Uh, that's the idea of the propensity scoring, I imagine. So couldn't we just look at the difference here in returns? I mean, just calculate the, the difference in returns here for the two groups. I mean, what you see in the regressions is that the other variables don't come out as being significant. And I guess it's a very simple explanation for that because you don't have very much variation in those because the groups are so similar when it comes to, for example, leverage. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting just to learn something about the difference here in the accumulated returns over this time period. You're saying with... Just, just a comparison between the, the differences in, in the abnormal returns uh, between these two firms without regard to the, any other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's the classical kind of setting where you do an experiment in physics or biology. You, you try to control the groups so they are extremely similar. And then you don't have to worry about the other characteristics because they are similar in all other regards. Yeah. So then so you, you can, can get... Right, the descriptive statistics, you see, you see just the differences between the treated and, and untreated companies in a matched uh, sample. And you see that the weighted average cumulative abnormal, abnormal bond return in the 11-day window is 
a greater for a Twitter companies. I guess that's what you would, uh, that that is what you uh, suggest, just to look at it. So that is the descriptive statistics shows us this, uh, this information. Uh, we we do continue with controlling for and and seeing whether this this uh, result is conveyed by the information content of this disclosure and not by other information in financial reports and that's why we further investigate uh, uh, the bond reaction uh, specifically to the inf to the information in the cash flow forecast. Yeah. And so. Yeah. But, so. so uh, but Aren't you a bit surprised that you don't get any significant coefficients on the other variables? So one of the explanations, so one of the explanations, as you mentioned, is the fact that these uh, uh, the other covariates are very similar uh, yes, between exactly. the two groups. Yeah, yeah. So so that is uh, absolutely correct. Yeah. So uh, um, in column three and four, we uh, calculate the same uh, regressions, but looking at the first time that a company disclosed this information, you see that the magnitude, as we would expect, is uh, greater uh, when comparing to the entire uh, sample. Uh, the next thing we do is we look at uh, a naive model. There's a couple of questions that... in the notes. Oh, so, um, oh. Um, okay, so I guess uh, my uh, can send it forth after present. Uh, the, okay, so maybe I'll skip that. Uh, the lack of voluntarily the voluntary disclosure before this regulation suggests a significant disclosure cost uh, or friction. Um, uh, so it, it is correct that there, there might be costs that we do not take uh, or consider or uh, test here in these in our uh, uh, this in our paper and and perhaps this also indicates that uh, the inefficiency in uh, not requiring a, a mandatory disclosure regime and perhaps that is why the regulator has uh, required this information um, I would just comment on that. Uh, this, I think it was a, a Jung's question. Uh, in Israel, the, as far as I can tell, there is no culture of voluntary disclosure, and it may very well be uh, friction. The, the way that you coined it is very nice, uh, calling it frictions. It, it could be a, a, some uh, underlying uh, legal uh, um, conservatism. But and it could be the size of the market, but but we really to, to essentially there is no analyst uh, forecasts per se. There is no management forecasts. It it just does not exist. Uh, so I agree that the setting here is is different. And and to, to Ruth's point, uh, arguably that's exactly why it needed to be mandated. Uh, it's a, so there's another question here by Joshua. He's not asking whether uh, these firms mo are mostly real estate and contract and contractors. And so we have uh, some uh, large, uh, um, many of the companies in our uh, data are real estate and investment companies, uh, but this orbit representation of uh, such industries uh, are not different from the representation of uh, bond uh, companies, companies that issue bond in Israel. And so, uh, and, and moreover, we also control for uh, industry effect. So I hope that uh, answered this question. Uh, Jeremiah is asking. Uh, yeah, you can ignore mine. I'm just. You can go on. I'm okay. just leaving them in here for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so maybe if you have questions, maybe just uh, open your uh, your and just say it out loud because it would be easier than uh, following all the questions. So, if, uh, I'm okay. So I'm going to continue unless somebody wants to ask a question. Okay, so the next thing uh, I, I want to show here is the results from a naive model forecast. Uh, and you can see that, as I mentioned earlier, we assume that cash flow operating cash flow forecasts follow random walk uh, with, the, uh, with the trend. And we follow a, a, a paper by Givoli, Hein, and Lehavi. And we show that they're looking at naive model forecast does not, you do not find any bond reaction to the information conveyed from a, from a naive model. And these falsification tests uh, helps us to uh, uh, 
to uh, find to show that our results is with regarding to the content of our information that is conveyed in the uh, in the forecast, and that this information cannot be conveyed from other uh, sources uh, in the financial reports. The next thing we yes, Odell. So a suggestion again, yeah, like because uh, I think that the, the 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 evidence in the paper is is uh, at least convincing to me. Uh, one one thing that you might wanna wanna see is kind of like try to gauge the overall benefit of this requirement by checking the market reaction to the announcement of the regulation, right? And trying to see whether it's kind of like uh, you know like the the bond prices of companies that were that that might be impacted in the future by by this regulation, uh, whether you already see the increase in in bond prices. Uh, when the regulation is announced. Yes, yeah, so, so that could be a, a, a good idea. Remember that the, this uh, regulation was initiated in 2008 in light of the financial crisis. Uh, so that uh, can, can contaminate our results a little bit with regarding to, uh, the, uh, to the reaction to the initial uh, regulation announcement. Uh, but we can still try to do something in that uh, with that respect. Um, okay. So we then look at a cross-sectional test where we compare or uh, divide our sample into companies with speculative bonds versus non-speculative bonds. And speculative bonds are companies, are bonds that are uh, graded below or at uh, triple B minus. Uh, and we find that uh, consistent with prior uh, research results that the information is driven by speculative bonds. That is where the information is mostly uh, relevant. Next thing we, we uh, do is we try to look at the different, the other components of the cash flow forecast as I uh, as, uh, was asked here earlier. I'm just gonna go quickly over the results. You can see here that when uh, considering the other uh, components of the cash flow forecast, we do not find that this information conveys any uh, uh, in any reliable information. We do not see that it loads. You can see that when considering these four element, four components together in column four, uh, only uh, the uh, cash flows uh, from operating activities that is the only information that is uh, uh, that loads and, and and is important for uh, bond investors. It, it is an interesting result. We have some uh, speculation for why uh, why this result, uh, the other components are less reliable. And next, we look at post and at post announcement bond returns and to find whether there is a over whether there is overreaction that is followed by a by by a post uh, and earnings bond returns. We do not see that it, that is the case. Meaning the react the initial reaction that we found. It does not seem to be an overreaction that is uh, reversed uh, later on. And uh, well, just a heads we... up, you have uh, two minutes left. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, and the last thing we estimate is economic effect of the disclosure. And as mentioned, uh, the purpose of the regulation was to inform uh, investors in earlier stages of uh, financial difficulties. And we look at recovery rates of companies uh, that disclose this information, mainly relative to companies prior to this uh, regulation requirement. We find that uh, treated companies, those that disclose the information, had recovery rates that were higher between 11% and 15% uh, relative to non-treated companies. Uh, and we performed some robustness tests. I'm gonna skip these uh, robustness tests. And, and so to summarize our findings, we utilize a unique setting from Israel. Uh, we studied the informativeness of this disclosure to bondholders. We do find that this information is informative uh, mainly with regarding to the operating cash flows. We find that the results are driven by non-investment grade bonds and that uh, the reaction does not reverse in the subsequent period. Uh, we show that uh, cash flow uh, forecasts uh, from naive model does not give an, any uh, bond reaction and that the information uh, content of the cash flow forecast cannot be uh, obtained elsewhere. Uh, yet we do not find that the other components uh, have uh, any additional or reliable information to uh, bond investors. And finally, consistent with the regulation objective, we find economic effect of high recovery rates by uh, disclosing firms. Uh, so to conclude, we believe that this uh, this evidence of forward-looking information that is mandatorily uh, required 
does provide useful information to bond investors in times of uncertainty. And we provide also evidence of economic benefit of this uh, disclosure. Um, and we believe that this, uh, this paper, this research could be of interest also uh, to uh, regulators when uh, considering whether to uh, require such uh, information uh, in certain circumstances. And so for just a reminder for the next uh, event of the accounting design project, uh, which will be next week at the same uh, time, the presenter is Paul Zarwin and the paper is R&D Accounting, Earnings Management and Investment Efficiency. Thank you so much for all the comments and suggestions. It is really appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruth, uh, for a great presentation of a great uh, paper. And thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, please join us uh, next week uh, at the same time.